Yeah, the the zone four work is like the long intervals, and I tested your buddy, or I think it was Sam's friend, uh, Adam. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah, he was telling me about some of the workouts where it was like you had to wait till – you know, you're doing an interval set. You need to wait till your heart rate got up to zone four, uh-huh. hold it for eight minutes, and then go off and do some strength work. And it's fucking brutal. Oh, man. <laughs> My wife, Lindsay, tested a few of those, and she got like 40 zone four minutes or something. Yeah. Which is a lot. That's one of the things I coach with some of my athletes is like accumulating time in zone. Yeah. So you might start someone at like, you know, 20 minutes of time at zone four and then slowly just progress towards like 40, maybe 60 minutes. Yeah. And by the end of those, you, you should feel pretty cooked. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 40 minutes of four, you're pretty cooked after mm-hmm. that. They were burning a ridiculous amount of calories, yep. like on their just on their watch tracking, like more than almost any other workout we've ever done. Just because of that like constant zone four. Yeah. I mean, you can hold it for longer than like a – VO2 max yeah. interval where you might be going for two to four minutes. Yeah. You can do 10 minutes and it's not as, you know, fatiguing, but accumulating that much time, you just get worked by the end. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's pretty cool though. It's cool thinking about like, I think like an ultimate kind of like functional hybrid athlete mm-hmm. needs to be paying attention to all these zones. Yeah. And I think once you kind of realize that, it does kind of change your perspective a little bit on training. Like a few years ago, like four or five years ago, I was just really addicted to like the uh, RP10s, like Mm. just which I define as like rate of preserved exertion 10. So it's like your max output effort day. And then you realize that that's just like, zap in your central nervous system oh yeah you're not actually recovered the next day you're actually not even recovered the day after that Mm -hmm. and so your body just starts to break down yeah you can only get so many of those in per week yeah and i see people all the time who they start doing that stuff always like every time they work out and then they just can't last. Yeah. Like they'll see fitness improvements like jump up really quick. Yeah. And then they'll start to plateau a little bit and then may start even like overtraining or starting to get injured. Yeah. So I see a lot of that. Yeah. Yeah. A big like, uh, you know, discussion in endurance training is intensity distribution. Mm-hmm. So like the amount of work or time you're spending in each zone, uh, like in a training block. So yeah, there's different, uh, like periodization strategies you can use around that, you know, like what percent of time are you spending in zone one, zone two versus zone three, zone four, or zone five. Yeah. And you can target different parameters of endurance training by understanding that distribution. That's so interesting. You'll have people come in and they're like, oh, hundred percent of time in zone five. And it's like, well, that's, that's not going to last long. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I know, yeah, your body will just break down. Oh yeah, but you need you need some five every now and then, yeah, to, to push those limits. Mm-hmm. I think some people, like endurance athletes, might stray away from that. Yeah, because it's different from going out for your, you know, hour long run or whatever. Like it feels much different, and like you said, it'll get in the way of your recovery. But doing some of that stuff at the right time of year for an endurance event can you know, push someone to, you know, peak yeah, and, you know, achieve like uh, a high level of performance yeah. just from, it doesn't take that long either. You could do six weeks of like some of those workouts and all of a sudden you're like, whoa, I feel like, I feel amazing. Then you could back it off a little bit mm-hmm. to recover. Yeah. With like elite athletes, endurance athletes that, that you're seeing a maximal effort type workout, are they doing just one a week or maybe sometimes two? Yeah, so those, uh, and I'll I'll back up a little bit. Some of the athletes I coach might be training for like mountain bike events or, you know, running events. And um, you need to be super mindful of how much intensity you're doing with them Mm -hmm. because their overall training volume is huge. You know, they might be training 15, 30 hours a week sometimes. Yeah. So 
that's like one of the most important parts of their training is getting that volume in. So if you're doing too much of those intensity workouts, that's going to affect recovery and they won't be able to wake up every day and get back on the bike or yeah. go out for a run. So with those like really high level, like let's say a zone five workout at max, I would do that like once a week, okay. maybe twice, depending on time of year. Yeah. But you might throw in another intensity today that's more focused on threshold, like yeah. some of those zone four work or even some zone three, what's called like tempo training yeah. where it's like long sustained intervals. Yeah. But yeah, you don't want to do too much of that zone five. Yeah, I can see that for sure. And I guess backing up for a second, we should we should let the listeners know kind of what business you're doing now, your coaching business and your your testing. And it it'd be interesting to hear how you how you even got into that, especially on the testing side. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I, my business is called Calibrated Coaching. A uh, little over a year into it. Um, I was working for four years at a PT sports medicine clinic, um, prior in Bozeman. Mm -hmm. Um, and I really got into the testing work. Um, you're introduced to it in undergrad, went to the university of Vermont and was, you know, learning about things like VO2 max and lactate threshold. And then when I went to grad school, um, in Colorado, I started to work in research um, basically doing tests of VO2 max mm -hmm. pre and post, um, like an exercise training intervention. Yep. And so you have to be pretty proficient and knowledge about the technical side of using all the equipment, interpreting results. So from there I started working with like local, uh, endurance athletes, um, in the lab testing them and, you know, in school, you're learning about like the definition of things. Yeah. Like, this is your VO2 max, but you don't necessarily learn as much as I think you should on application because, you know, VO2 max is like cool. You can put it on your refrigerator, tell your mom, like, <laughs> yeah. my VO2 max is this. Yeah. But what do you do with that? So, in that process of starting to work with higher level athletes, I was learning about okay, here's this person's testing results. How can I help make this person better? Um, so fast forward to where I am now. I um, you know, now own my own testing equipment mm -hmm. and I work with you know, locals in the community who want to know this information and want to check in on how they're training and if they're doing the right thing. Yeah. And so your graduate school degree, what was it in? Um, so it's... It's basically like an exercise physiology program, okay. master's focused. Um, but the lab I worked in was at around 8,000 feet. Mm -hmm. So it was called the High Altitude Exercise Physiology Program. Awesome. And that was in uh, Western Colorado in Gunnison. Okay. Um, so I got a, you know, great experience, like being able to study both, um, you know, athletes, like clinical populations and, um understand that in the lens of an environmental stressor like altitude mm -hmm. um, which was just fascinating because our bodies just function much differently yeah in the mountains when we're <laughs> yeah in gunnison you probably see like elite runners skiers mountain bikers oh, yeah it's kind of like a, a hub for endurance athletes yeah in the mountains mm -hmm. at high elevation oh yeah that's awesome and how many how many like tests were you running back then uh, kind of depended. Um, if I was working on like a research study, you know, you need to have a certain number of subjects in the study. Mm -hmm. So it might be anywhere from like 10 to 30 people, um, that you're running through an intervention. Um, and the testing is kind of concentrated. So if we're doing an eight week intervention, you know, studying like some like sprint interval workout or, um, some form of training, you want to get all the people tested, you know, pre that eight, eight week program mm -hmm. in a short period of time. So a lot of times it's like you're in the lab for a week, like there for 12 hours a day, just testing, you know, making sure all the data works, making sure your equipment's working. Yeah. Um, and then 
you let the subjects go and, you know, do the intervention and you're checking in with them and then you have to retest again. So um, sometimes in the field, it's like, all right, we're all in right now. We have to get this testing done. And then you back off a little bit and then it starts back up. So dang. <laughs> and I assume like the base population out there in the world mm -hmm. has probably not had their VO2 max tested unless they were in a, like an elite endurance sport or like fire or military. Right. So what kind of, what kind of like baseline numbers are people looking for if they go in for the first time? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the, in terms of like application of the information, people want to know, um, their training zones. Mm -hmm. Um, so with a VO2 max or a lactate threshold, you can really understand what training zones are for the individual. And we have a lot of like age prediction equations that people go off of, of like, okay, my zone two is this range because it's a percent of this number. And that doesn't always apply to everyone. Mm -hmm. um, and people start to pay attention to these metrics like heart rate or pace or power if they're on the bike. And they're like, well, there's kind of a mismatch here. Like what I'm feeling isn't uh, closely tied to like what these numbers are showing. So they will hire me to test them so they can understand their bodies a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So those training zones are important. And then the VO2 max number uh, is kind of like a baseline number. It tells us how well your body is able to basically breathe in oxygen and transport it to working muscle for okay. aerobic metabolism. Got so, it. Um, that number along with like our lactate threshold numbers are really giving us a kind of a definition or identification of what someone's physiology is like. Mm -hmm. And then you can start to like make recommendations for that person based Got on it. what their goals are. Cause if it's, if it's significantly low, just my VO two max, right. then I'm, I'm pretty unhealthy. I have some work to do. And then once I get like in that higher range, you'll see like elite athletes in the like high fifties, high sixties, high seventies into the eighties. But even like an elite athlete can still have like a, a lower VO two max than another elite athlete and still right. perform at a high level. Oh yeah. Yeah. So that's important to understand the different like parameters of endurance. So a lot of times I test people and they're like, okay, you know, my VO two max is 65 and they'll be like, am I going to win this race? And I'm like, I don't know. Like <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot more that goes into it. But yeah. if you have like two people at a start line, um, one has a higher VO two max than the other, um, that's not going to tell us like who's going to win. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then you need to look at the other parameters in the mix there. Um, first thing you need to do is understand what the, the de like demands of the race are. You know, does this race require VO2 max? So if you're running a 100-mile ultramarathon, you know, you're not necessarily accessing your VO2 max yep. as much as like running a 10K on the road. Yeah. Um, so understanding like what's important for your event. Um but the classic like parameters of uh, endurance performance are VO2 max, uh, lactate threshold, uh, running economy, mm -hmm. and then there's a fourth that's coming out that's called durability. So okay. how well you can actually use your system over a certain span of time. Mm -hmm. um, so you can put numbers to all those things and understand it on an individual level and compare one person to another and understand like who's going to be you know the best performer in that scenario interesting that's wild and you're a you're a big proponent of like regardless of where i live regardless of kind of what sport or even if i'm not uh training that it's it's pretty wise for me to walk in somewhere locally and get my vo2 max tested yeah, I think so. Um, you know, there's some great research papers out there. 
um, talking about just health span mm-hmm. in relation to VO2 max. And we were talking before this and, you know, you go into the doctor maybe once a year, you get your blood work, your, you know, blood pressure, um, all these different things that are going to tell us about your health. Yeah. But VO2 max is one of the best predictors of uh, all cause mortality related to disease. Mm-hmm. So it's not something we test though. Um, and I think that's interesting. That is interesting. Yeah. So I think the data is so black and white to me, that was really helpful going through the testing with you here in the lab. And it was really helpful when that same week we went and did the scans. Right. And the, everything is so like subjective before you like look at that data mm-hmm. and then it becomes so much more literal where it was like you could tell if someone was out of shape or they felt out of shape or they felt in shape. It was all these gut feelings. Right. Like they feel like they're doing okay. Mm-hmm. But then once they saw the data from that week of testing, it was like, boom, like life change moments where right. some people realized through the scan that there was there was more fat on their organs than was at a healthy level, even though they didn't feel like super obese or anything. Yeah. And it, it was these eye-opening moments of like, wow, I really need to change some things in my lifestyle. And we saw the same thing through the VO2 max where someone, they have that gut feeling of, Maybe they have some work to do, but then they get that VO2 number. And if it comes in low, they're like, wow, I really need to make some life changes here. Yeah. I mean, the same if you like learned your cholesterol was through the roof. Yeah. You're like, I got to get on medication for this. Mm -hmm. Um, It's the same thing for, you know, your cardiorespiratory fitness there. Yeah. Um, It should be a call to action for people to like, okay, here's where I'm at. Um, My risk of, you know, whatever disease it is, is going to increase. Yeah. So this needs to, you know, drive my action to, you know, focus on endurance, focus on cardiovascular training. Yeah. Yeah. That's super awesome. I think like the more, the more data, the better, like you can't change what you can't measure. And so Mm -hmm. for people to see that and, and, then be able to base their training around their objectives is it, it was re- very helpful for oh, me yeah. for sure. That's cool. I think the the lactate threshold was super interesting to me too because like as a as like a backcountry hunter, I think it's probably similar to that analogy you used of like the hundred miler, mm. where in a hunting situation you probably don't need to rely on your vo2 max yeah. that often because mm-hmm. you are operating most of the days at that lower zone right so if a typical uh like backcountry hunt is like 72 hours and you're doing a lot of like slow movements yep. through the backcountry you're not pushing that that vo2 max threshold Mm -hmm. Um, but there are different spurts throughout the hunting event where you well, right. And that is certainly where you see the lactate threshold kick in where like some of your buddies will just like pull a really steep hill really fast under heavy load Mm -hmm. and you can, they just aren't getting that lactic acid in their legs where some people are and they're, they're bonking on that same hill much earlier for sure. So we should dive into that lactate threshold for a bit Mm because it it was really interesting hearing from you, like how we can do certain things to move that lactic dump into our legs a little bit further down the line. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say the lactate gives me like really actionable information for people. Um, It is essentially a measure of efficiency. Um, so when we do a test, we're trying to understand, um, you know, someone's energy systems Mm -hmm. that are at play in response to graded exercise. So meaning low intensity to max. Um, so with lactate threshold, we have two different thresholds. You have the first lactate threshold. Um, sometimes it's referred to as the aerobic threshold. Mm -hmm. And then our second lactate threshold, 
Um, sometimes it's referred to as like the anaerobic threshold or uh, critical power, maximal lactate steady state. So different names for these things. Um, but when we think about a threshold, it's kind of important to define what that is. Yeah. Right. So um, for me, a threshold is uh, when a physiologic system is being pushed to its max, then our body has to figure out another way for us to, you know, maintain homeostasis. Yeah. So that first lactate threshold is essentially a turn point of where we start to switch or um, change how we're producing energy to meet the workload. Um, so at that intensity, we'll see, uh, you know, or below that intensity, we're going to be burning uh, fat, hopefully. Um, we're using slow twitch muscle fiber and we're using basically aerobic metabolism. Okay. So when that's like a very efficient system that should be able to go all day. Yeah. It's called slow twitch, not because it contracts slowly, but because it fatigues slowly. Yeah. Um, that's the muscle fiber that's, um, has a high density of mitochondria, um, good blood flow to it. Um, but it can only do so much work. Mm -hmm. Right. So when we've, pushed that energy system to its max, we'll reach that threshold. Got it. Once we cross that threshold, which will be the top or the separation point between zone two and zone three heart rate mm -hmm. in a five zone model, um, we're going to have basically a hormonal response where we start to release epinephrine, so adrenaline. And that's going to lead to the recruitment of fast twitch muscle fiber and the utilization of glycogen, mm -hmm. which is our stored form of carbohydrates. Crazy. So that first threshold is super important for endurance athletes. Um, if you're going to be pushing yourself for, you know, hours on end, you want to have that threshold as a high, as of a higher percent of your view to max as possible. Um, because once we start to tap into that glycogen and using that fast twitch muscle fiber, we're not going to last quite as long um, doing an endurance event. So you want to basically preserve that glycogen um, the best you can, mm -hmm. because once you run out of it, you're you're kind of screwed. You're it's gonna out. Yeah, yeah. You, unless you're taking in carbohydrates, you're gonna hit the wall and bonk. Yeah, and so that is why you see like elite endurance athletes, even elite mountain hunters, have figured this out where they'll be watching their watch to see right. their heart rate, and they're doing everything they can to stay out of zone three. Yeah, for so, certain workouts. Yeah, so mm -hmm. stay because they know that if they stay in like two, that they're going to be able to go all day long. Right, it's and, a pacing strategy. Yeah, yeah. That just in the last couple of years, I saw where mountain hunters have kind of figured that out. Mm -hmm. It's I definitely saw it like in the ultra running community where if they know that like if they're going to go into three and four, it's going to cause some ramifications right. that they might not get out of so they might save their three and four for the right moment mm -hmm. and you see hunters do that now too where like hiking in hiking out or like movements through the day just paying attention to staying out of three and staying in zone two can make like the whole experience so much better yeah for sure and there's a lot of individual you know responses to that mm -hmm. like we saw with the testing where um you know, some people, their lactate's going to shoot up um, really high as soon as they start, you know, ramping up intensity. Yeah. Um, whereas others can keep it really low. Um, and it's not that they're not producing lactate. It's that they can dispose of it and recycle it um, very efficiently. Mm -hmm. So they go up that steep hill, you know, rucking, and they're pushing the pace. Yeah. Um, they are producing lactate. They are burning through glycogen but they have the insane ability to recycle it and actually reuse that lactate as a fuel source. Hmm. Whereas the person next to them, who maybe doesn't have a good endurance base, uh, that lactate's gonna go up and they're gonna um, you know, not really last quite as long. They're gonna get to the top of that hill and be winded. So two different types of physiology there and yeah. one of them needs to work on you know, some things whereas the other needs to focus on others. Yeah, that was what was so helpful for me for the testing was you can really kind of figure out what you as an individual specifically need to work on right. for your specific mm -hmm. goals, where like you need to know your goal and your data 
to start tweaking your training to like accomplish your mission. Yeah. We're like the same program can't work for everyone in the same, um, everyone's going to have different numbers. And so like if, if your lactate threshold needs work, that's a different kind of training mm -hmm. than if your VO2 max needs exactly. work, which is really helpful. Yep. We should break down the zones just yep. so that that's pretty black and white for people. For sure. So there's a lot of different zone models out there. Um, I tend to use a five zone heart rate model. Mm -hmm. um, and what I do with testing is I identify those thresholds I mentioned before. So the first and second lactate thresholds. Um, so that first threshold is going to be separating zone two from zone three. Um, so below that threshold in zone one and zone two, um, that would be doing easy work. So you should be able to probably hold a conversation um, and breathe easy mm -hmm. in zone one and zone two. Um, and then in zone three, uh, that's where we start to push intensity up. And, uh, you know, you're going to be challenged to hold that for longer durations mm -hmm. and you're going to have to recover, um, a little, a little bit more if you're pushing that. Yep. Um, and then zone four, I call that sub threshold. Um, so this is where our ability to process or recycle lactate is reaching its max. Um, so above that zone in zone five, where we're accessing VO2 max, um, that's where lactate starts to accumulate exponentially. So we can't clear it fast enough. Got it. Um, so when an athlete is trying to follow zones, it can be really helpful mm -hmm. because they can target different parameters of their physiology um, to reach whatever their goals are. Um, so someone might be like, okay, I want to improve my ability to burn fat. Okay, so we know in zone one and zone two, um, you're most likely to be burning high levels of fat. So that system is working um, at a high rate. Mm -hmm. So to target fat burning, you need to have an idea of what zone one and zone two are. So you can target that intensity and make that improvement. And then what about zone five? Yeah. So <laughs> that's, that's the hard stuff, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so when we're training zone five, uh, no matter how far you are past that threshold, um, you're going to reach VO2 max. So your oxygen kinetics or how quickly you're consuming oxygen is going to push you to the point where you're working your VO2 max at, at its highest rate. Mm -hmm. So typically zone five work is done in uh, high intensity intervals. Um, and there's a lot of different formats for hit training. Um, typically with my athletes, I'm prescribing zone five intervals to improve VO2 max. Mm -hmm. um, so, the adaptations from zone five training are uh, very cardiovascular. So we're pushing our heart um, Hard. and our blood vessels to their max. Um, so a workout might be, you know, four sets of four minutes at zone five mm -hmm. with a one to one work rest ratio where you're giving yourself plenty of time to recover between sets. Yeah. And then you're just keep trying to access that VO2 max and, yeah, in physiology, when we're pushing a system, that's where we drive adaptation. Mm -hmm. And so zone five is your maximal effort, but you're only going to be able to live in that environment for short amount of time. Right. And so like a like a MMA fighter is going to do probably quite a bit more zone five training, like to get ready for those like maximal effort three minute rounds. Sure. Where like a hundred mile athlete is going to spend more time like on that zone two, zone three. Yeah. So kind of depends on like the person, but with that, you know, ultra marathoner, um, they're less likely to focus on VOT max and they're going to want to, if they're doing intensity, which I think they should, no mm -hmm. matter what your event is, um, you're probably doing a mixture of like zone three, like long, like race pace intervals, or zone four, like threshold work. Mm -hmm. um, and 
that type of athlete, they're trying to push their lactate threshold to a really high percent yeah. of their VO2 max um, so that they can operate at as high of an intensity as possible without seeing that lactate accumulate. Mm-hmm. Um, so that requires, you know, long like zone four workouts typically yeah, to like push that threshold up. Yeah. So I think that like those long zone fours could be one of the most potentially valuable things for like a mountain hunter. Yeah. Just to move that, like the high levels of lactate, further down the line and they're mm-hmm. like in their steep climbs under heavy load. Oh yeah. I could definitely see that. And those workouts hurt. Yeah. So when someone's like packing out a large animal, like, like I'm sure they're doing it for, it could be a long time. Right. Yeah. And it's, I don't know what your heart rate would be, but I'm sure it's going to be pretty pegged. Yeah. So it's like a, a long time at intensity. Yeah. Right. So you need to learn to tolerate that and just have that durability of like, tolerating intensity so you're not falling apart yeah and ruining your hunt I, and for people to to learn that and try that on their own at home like if i wanted to if i wanted to train zone four significantly over the next few months first thing i need to do is really figure out what my actual zone four is so like the five level zone model is all percentages of my max heart rate correct Um, some people do it that way. Um, the way I do it is I measure the thresholds individually. Okay. And then the thresholds, uh, influence what the zones are. Got it. So zone four is going to be like 95% of lactate threshold. Okay. So once you learn your lactate threshold number, Mm -hmm. um, which you do in the lab or there's some field testing too, you could figure out, um, where you take 95% of that number and that's going to give you a heart rate range for zone four. Okay. So that's why it's pretty critical to go in and get tested. Yeah, I think so. Just if, you know, you're putting all that effort in to train Mm -hmm. um, and if you have the access to a lab, it's certainly an investment in yourself, but yeah. um, You know, it's going to help. Yeah, for (laughs) sure. And you were actually pulling my blood to figure that out. What was going on there? Yeah, so when you do a, a lactate measure, um, you you want to uh, make sure that your protocol is allowing lactate to kind of level out. Mm-hmm. Um, so doing what I call a step test, where you're doing like um, several minutes of an intensity, and then you know adding intensity. Um, so at the end of like a three, sometimes even you know, four or five minute long stage, you basically swab someone's finger with alcohol wipe, and then you make a small incision and you grab a blood sample. Mm-hmm. And that's going to give us a number telling us what your, your lactate accumulation is in it, the blood. So that's actually measuring my lactate that's sitting in my bloodstream. Yeah. And I think it's important to note, like that number is, it's a measure of flux. Okay. So in the bloodstream where uh, we're adding lactate in from working muscle, and then there's other areas of the body that's taking that lactate out of the bloodstream. Mm-hmm. So there's an input and an output. So the number we're getting is telling us uh, those two individual systems, how they're working at different intensities. Got it. If that makes sense. Yeah. And what is what do you... What has been like the lowest and highest VO2 max you've seen <laughs> in your testing? Um, I've seen a VO2 max as high as 80 mLs per kilogram. Mm-hmm. Um, so we, we express VO2 max relative to body weight typically. Um, so that like really high number is someone who's very competitive yeah. um, at endurance events. Um, on the low end... Um, I think I've tested someone as low as like 15, maybe 18, uh, mLs per kg. Um, so their just general work capacity at that level, um, is going to be, yeah, challenged. Mm -hmm. So getting up out of bed or walking upstairs, they're going to be winded. Yeah. Um, so you need to really think about how important that is for someone's just like functional, like everyday you know, quality of life. Yeah. Cause if, you know, you can't, you know, walk up the stairs, you know, you're going to be 
just sitting in bed all day, right? Yeah. And that's just going to drive health outcomes um, worse and worse over time. Yeah, it's just a downward spiral. Oh, yeah. And then those those max levels, those high ones, like close to the 80s and in the 80s, that is something that we saw a lot like in the like Tour de France type athletes, oh, yeah. right? Because they need they need the endurance to go multiple days, mm -hmm. but they also need that like max power to climb those hills. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it's a, it's a balance there. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, having a really high VO2 max is super important for those guys. Um, it's what allows them to push such outputs so efficiently. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, they also are able to keep lactate values very low. Yeah. Um, cause they're so good at recycling it. Um, I know there was some discussion somewhere about like, you know, Lance Armstrong, like, you know, they did some lactate tests on him and his lactate just like wasn't increasing due to adding intensity. Hmm. And everyone was like, well, he just doesn't produce lactate. Um, but that's not true. Yeah. He is producing lactate. Um, he's burning calories so fast and producing so much lactate, but he's able to recycle that lactate and keep it really low mm -hmm. and reuse lactate as a fuel source. Um, whereas someone else, they, they're going to see lactate just jump up yeah. and they're pushing that output that those guys do. And we've all felt that, right? That jump in lactate is when you feel like your legs go dead, like yep. that, just that achy feeling that mm -hmm. just flushes in there all at one time. Yeah. So when you do a test, it's pretty easy to tell someone's like, past that second threshold yeah um all of us like they'll be feeling good like oh i got this and then all of a sudden we'll add a you know a little bit of intensity to the test and they're like oh yep this is this is hard now it happens fast yeah, yeah. and then you'll see changes in how they breathe too so usually like respiratory frequency is going to start really jumping up mm -hmm. so at that point they can't hold a conversation at all like they'll have to you know, if you're communicating with them during a test, they might say, I'm good. And then they're taking a breath. Like, you know, there's, there's no conversing happening. Yeah. So it's pretty obvious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It happens quick. That's what happened to me. I was like, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Oh, I'm not good. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. Really fast. <laughs> <laughs> so for the ability to process, process lactate, what is the best style of training I should be looking at? Cause I think that one's probably one of the most important ones for like a functional mountain athlete. Right. Cause you just don't want to have that bonk on the mountain. Yeah, for sure. Um, so a little bit about, um, what processes lactate. Um, so when a, a muscle fiber produces lactate from burning carbohydrates, um, that lactate is essentially, um, binding to a, an acid and it's removing it from the muscle cell. Um, so where it gets picked up is usually adjacent slow twitch muscle fiber where that lactate's gonna enter into that fiber and then use it as a fuel source. Mm -hmm. So um, a great example of this is the heart. So the heart is you know almost 100% slow twitch muscle fiber. Um, it actually, you know, when you're in, past zone three, your heart only uses lactate as a fuel source um, as opposed to like glucose. Okay. So expanding that a little bit, um, we need to find the type of training that's really pushing that slow twitch muscle fiber system. Mm -hmm. um, so endurance athletes who are well-trained will have a really high percent of slow twitch muscle fiber. They might have, you know, 60, 70% of their muscle fiber that's slow twitch. Um, and that's why they can keep lactate so low. Mm -hmm. So knowing that and applying it to training, um, we know that in zone one and zone two, that's where you're really pushing those slow twitch fibers to work at their physiological max. So if you can do, uh, you know, one workout or one type of workout is just like long, slow distance training. So someone looking at their heart rate, making sure they're staying below zone two and 
fatiguing that system. Mm -hmm. So that takes time, right? You yeah. know, those slow twitch, they can, they can last all day. Yeah. So you need to have a high training volume to do that. Um, and sometimes people even know, need to move to zone one to achieve Crazy. that. That's super interesting. Cause like the, some of the potentially best training for us is kind of the hardest to actually get done because it's relatively easy and boring. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's like <laughs> some of the most important stuff can be the most boring stuff. Right. Have you found any like fun ways to do zone one and two training? Yeah. Um, I've been messing around with this for years because I get that same feedback. Like this is boring. Yeah. Like this isn't doing anything. I'm not feeling tired. Yeah. Um, so one way you can do it is uh, what's called a lactic interval training. Um, so let's say you have someone running or cycling in zone one or zone two, um, you can have them do some short all out sprints throughout that workout. Mm -hmm. Um, and the sprints need to be short enough that we don't tap into that glycolytic or carbohydrate burning system. So those have to be usually 10 seconds or less. Um, so when we're doing those 10 seconds or less sprints, we're accessing our creatine phosphate system. Hmm. Um, so we pass that 10 second point. That's when we start to really need to burn through glycogen because we'll deplete that those creatine stores really quickly. Yeah. So you have someone do, I don't know, a hour long run and every five minutes break into like a all out 10 second sprint. Yeah. And you can still achieve that zone too. Um, but it makes it a little bit more exciting. Makes it more fun, yeah. <laughs> Someone's watching you. You're just sprinting. Yeah, <laughs> he's looking slow. Oh wow, he's like taking <laughs> off. Hope he's okay. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting because it is it is hard to do. I think especially for me, I went through like a phase of life where we were uh, really into like marathons and ultra marathons, right. and you're you're pretty used to just out running, and you're you're pretty used to those long slow days yep. and outside like in mother nature they're not bad but then shifting to like functional training you definitely get hooked on like the adrenaline the right. endorphin dump after like a really hard work you get kind of like hooked on getting like really sweaty kind yep. of getting smoked this feels like work yeah you know it must be driving improvement. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I think like the, the zone two is, is tricky. I think, um, just those long, slow rucks have helped me a lot. Yeah. Too. Just like, cause then you get some, like you get some creativity with just putting on a heavy pack, getting outside, walking, not so worried about your pace, not pushing that pace. Yeah. But, but that has helped me quite a bit. Yeah, and I mean, if you're doing these long hunts that require that, like, you yeah. have to do that. You, yeah. There's no shortcuts. Yeah. And I think people are always going to want to, like, what's the fastest way I can see improvement? Mm -hmm. What's the minimum amount of time that I can see my <laughs> fitness improve? Yeah. And that's just kind of the culture we live in, unfortunately. Yeah. But you got to put the time in. You got to do the work. For the sure. The and from, like, your testing now, you, you're you seeing that, like, it's going to take, like, eight, 10, 12 weeks to move these numbers? Yeah. I mean, traditional like training studies are usually a minimum of, you know, eight weeks, mm -hmm. um, to see that adaptation happen. Um, but you know, we look for those numbers to improve, but working with people, you're also, you want to check in with them as it's happening and they should start to feel improvements even before those like numbers might start to show up where they start to be like, oh, I can last longer. I can, I feel better on these long runs. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like you do have to kind of commit to it and, you know, trust the process. Um, but I've seen tons and tons of clients over the years just, you know, really get a better hold of their endurance from applying some of that stuff that's not as sexy and, yeah, you know, crushing you as some of the high intensity workouts, which <laughs> yeah. those are important. You know, yeah. you don't want to knock those out of your program, but, um, accessing that energy system I mentioned, yeah. you need to do. 
Yeah, it's pretty it's pretty amazing just how like to really train at an optimal level, you do really have to like break down the event you're training for. Right. And train specifically for that event, mm-hmm. and everything's so much different. So it's like, if you want to be like at an elite level in something, you have to train for that very specific event. Oh, yeah. And like broad general training is better than no training at all. Right. But like getting really specific about like what are the skill requirements of the event? What zones am I going to be in? Yeah. What do I need to actually work on? And I'm sure you see some of that with like your clients. Like you were talking about it earlier today, just the difference between like a long bike event in a, in a short one, just like the loss of power. Mm -hmm. Um, You really have to decide what you're going after. Yeah, you can't be a you know hundred miler and also a one miler and yeah. be like good at both of those things. Yeah, unfortunately, you know some are able to figure it out, which requires a lot of planning and careful, uh, you know, periodization of like what the training load is over time. Yeah, um, but yeah, I d- I've definitely found with my clients and myself personally that um, you know if you're only focused on like really long slow endurance it will come at the cost of like your top end ability to like do that, like really hard work as well. Mm-hmm. So you got to figure out like what your goals are in yeah. that instance, you know? Yeah. Pick your goals and then build the training around those goals. Mm-hmm. What are some of the events you're working on for this year and next year personally? Personally. Yeah. So I, I usually do like mountain bike racing. Um, last year I did a, a race called the Vapor Trail 125, mm-hmm. um, which is in uh, outside of Salida, Colorado. Um, and it was my first event like of that distance where you basically start at 10 p.m. at night and then you ride through the night um, at high altitude um, on mountain bike trails for 125 miles. Dang. Um, so that was a, a definitely a life-changing experience for me to like, yeah, you know, push myself for that duration. Like it took me like 19 hours Dang. <laughs> on a mountain bike. It's a long time. Yeah. After. yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I like, I, I think I have that, you know, ability to yeah. do endurance and enjoy the process of that. So I'm going to do, um, the Butte hundred awesome. this summer, um, down. Yeah. West of us here in Bozeman. Awesome. Um, and I'm stoked on that one because it's, similar like race demands to that one I did last year. Um, but the altitude's not in the picture quite as much. Yeah. So I grew up at sea level. Yeah. And you know, when I was doing that race last year, every time I got above like 10, 11,000 feet, I just started to feel horrible. The elevation. And then I would, then I would descend down to like, you know, 8,000 feet and like, Oh, I feel good. I can push. <laughs> so the race this summer, um, you know, it's going to be hot, which will be a different environmental stressor that I need to focus on, but yeah. um, I won't have to deal with the altitude quite as much, which yeah. is just so hard sometimes. Yeah, altitude is wild. And you'll be below eight probably for that whole race. Yeah, I, I got to check it, but I, I'm pretty sure it's like not quite the same. Like that race I did, we almost got up to 13,000 feet um, Jeez. at one point of it. And that was for me like right at sunrise. And, you know, right before there, I, I was on another mountain pass and I, you know, started to feel the altitude to the point of getting like brain fog mm-hmm. and I took a wrong turn. Oh. <laughs> so <laughs> I like pitch dark. I had like my bike lights on. Otherwise, you know, you can't see anything. Yeah. And I just missed a turn and descended like an extra mile and probably like 500,000 vertical. Oh man. And I was like, God. Oh. <laughs> so, I mean, I don't want to blame it on the altitude, you yeah. know, but yeah, that was a kind of a bummer and, um, definitely added some, some stress to the system. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now you're stressed cause you're going the wrong direction and you got more work to do to get out of there. Yeah. And eating is so hard when you're at high elevation too. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the main things that happens, we start to ventilate to breathe a lot more, um, when we start to go to high altitude. So that breathing actually is a huge energy demand. Um, and it requires a lot of blood flow to our lungs. Mm -hmm. So where's that going to come from? Right. So the first place is your 
digestive system. So your gut all of a sudden isn't getting the blood flow nutrients it needs. So you're trying to shove food down your mouth and it's just it's not, not working. It's just not working. Like Dang. you're just not getting like everything you need for that, you know, digestive system to work. Yeah. I definitely have felt that before on like ultra marathon type events where like stomach management is almost the biggest <laughs> yeah part. yeah ultras is like really a competition of just eating yeah yeah <laughs> and you're like just trying to do it all right so that your like stomach doesn't roll over yeah because yeah. once once that happens you're you're screwed yeah it's gonna ruin your day <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's hard to come back from that so it, you have noticed like training for more endurance that like your power has gone down but that's fine because your objective is another hundred. And so you're, you're tailoring your training for that. Yeah. I think like, you know, training, you know, it's, it's not like a, this year, like I'm going to work on this. Like it's multiple years of yeah. like improving. And I wanted to just push myself last summer to like, see if I could do that distance. And, yeah. Um, I developed like a huge aerobic base doing mm. that. So this summer I hope to kind of maintain that base, but also, um, work on power because with sports like mountain biking, it's a lot of it's momentum. So like to have that top end, um, power allows you to like coast more mm. and like, um, keep a higher average speed. Yeah. So that was like a lacking part of the training for sure. I was so focused on like, all right, I have to go eight hours today, 12 hours, 14 leading up to it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it takes a lot of time to recover from that. Yeah. So I wasn't doing the, the intervals or the, the sprints, all that stuff. So, um, that in combination with some weight training I yeah. think is good for the, the top end power. Um, so hopefully not losing that too much. <laughs> so what's your training kind of look like for this year? Um, yeah. So, you know, in the winter, um, you know, living in Montana, like you just can't bike, yeah. um, unless you're like indoor on a trainer yeah. and I just don't like doing that cause it's like torture. <laughs> yeah. So I do a lot of ski mountaineering in the winter, um, working on just like trying to push long days and getting used to that. Yeah. Um, so you know, in March I did like a 12 hour ski traverse with a friend um, up here in highlight. And I was like, cool, I still have the ability to go all day. Mm -hmm. Um, and as we get closer to this event, it's going to get more specific where I'm going to start pushing my long days on the bike now. Yeah. So each week I try to get a long day in, um, where, you know, I'm just keep pushing that distance. Um, but throughout the week trying to maintain riding frequency a lot. Um, so trying to ride most days of the week. Yeah. And then hopefully like one day a week trying to do some intensity training. So that might be on the mountain bike doing some really steep climbing or on the gravel road bike doing some intervals. Like some hill sprints. Yeah, yeah. stuff like that. It's not the most fun stuff. Yeah. I'd rather just be like riding fun trails, but. <laughs> <laughs> it's important stuff. Yeah. And then, yeah, for me, the weight training is like super important. Yeah. Um, Cause like if you're on a, like, humans aren't designed to be designed to be on a bike. Right. So you need to make sure like your low back is strong and like, yeah. you know, your shoulders, all that, your core can kind of tolerate the demands of being on a bike. Yeah. So yeah, definitely not letting like strength go to the wayside either. Yeah. So a couple of days a week of strength training. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Have you found any like nutrition hacks for on race day that's working for you? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, one of the big things on those long events is like you, you can only tolerate so much like straight sugar. Yeah. Um, where you're like just eating gummy bears or gels and like, uh, one of my coworkers told me the term, uh, gummy tummy yeah. where you're just like no more. <laughs> so trying to find actually some savory stuff, yeah. um, in the mix and almost having like a menu of like not just doing the same thing over and over. Um, but last summer I started making some like real food options. So I'd use, uh, rice and make like these rice cakes nice. where I'd put like sushi rice, um, uh, like bacon, peanut butter and like soy sauce and kind of like put it in a little like 
easy to like eat like a little ball. Yeah. And rice is a great option because it's high in water content. Okay. So, you know, when we're digesting things, our stomach requires like fluids to like break it down. Yeah. So if you're putting rice into the system, you know, it already has that water content, so it's easy to digest. Got it. Um, so yeah, kind of messing around with like different like homemade recipes has been kind of fun. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I certainly still like using like gels and stuff that's like convenient. Cause like when you're on a bike, you have to like reach into your pocket and like you're going take a you know, a hand off a handlebar. <laughs> There's rocks and like roots and stuff, you're gonna eat shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You gotta be fast. Yeah. That rice ball is a good tip though. Like like hunting is the same way. You just get so sick of like goos and gels. Bars gummies too, and bars. Yeah. yeah. It's all sugar. By the end of the season, you you like can't look at another yeah, bar. Yeah, I know. There's certain products I just can't look at anymore. Yeah, <laughs> just over it. Yeah. Well, awesome, man. Thanks for coming in. It, it's really awesome to learn about this data and like how important it is. It was a game changer for us, like for That's me awesome. and for the lab. I think like getting that test done, I would recommend to everyone VO2 max and lactate threshold. And like, regardless of where you live, you should look at that. Cause like, once you get that in front of you, like you really start opening your eyes to like, yeah, when, how you should be training, where you're at, where mm -hmm. do you want to go? And then looking for some of the best things out of this testing. And we saw this from your testing and from the scans is like there are there are some things in here that can save someone's life like yeah. for people that have never been tested or haven't been tested in five years like a lot of these physical fitness and endurance type tests can pick up on like a a red flag that you do need for to get sure. checked out right away that you might not even know about mm -hmm. yeah if if you have access to someone who can do testing that's great um, for, I think this testing is getting more and more available, mm -hmm. um, with like improvements in technology. Um, but yeah, it's, you might have to go to like a university lab and poke your head in and ask if there's like a grad student who would like run you through a test and yeah. explain the results. Um, but I think the biggest thing is like, if you do have access to it, making sure, you know, you know how to interpret the results. Yeah. Like it's one thing to test and like, have a number, but knowing like what to do with it is like what's most important. That's huge. Yeah. 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 That interpretation's everything kind of like when you broke down that stuff for me, it's, it's totally different than just knowing the number. Oh yeah. yeah Cause that, that's big. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Tom. Well, thanks so much. Right on. Appreciate yeah. Thanks you. Dustin. It's been fun. Thanks. Cool.